The title of this talk is The Ignatian Conversion, Psycho-Spiritual Perspectives. Our objective is to provide psychological, spiritual, and even psychiatric perspectives on the conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola. These perspectives will provide a deeper understanding of the phenomenon and conversion of, Ignatian, of Ignatius in terms of Ignatian spirituality in general. It also can provide a paradigm for our own processes of conversion and self-transformation. There will be two parts of this presentation. The first part deals with the introduction of the phenomenon of conversion or religious transformation and an attempt to apply this to the crisis period of St. Ignatius of Loyola. The second part will deal with his quest period at Montserrat and will end in his commitment to serve and love the Lord as a consequence of his choices. Psychology and psychiatry are useful tools in understanding the consciousness of any person and for the healing mental health issues. But the dynamic process of the religious or spiritual conversion and transformation of an individual remains a mystery, how it happens. This is a result of many factors, perhaps even hard to detect until we reach the summit and truth of religious faith. Faith that is blind to our eyes and deaf to our ears gives us the certainty and reality of our spiritual experiences. We are certain there have been changes and we are certain that in our view, these changes are true according to our experiences. Religious experience is central to the conversion experience. Religious experience is foundational. Carl Jung, in his book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, wrote, among all many patients in the second half of life, that is to say, over 35, there's not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a spiritual outlook on life. The telling question of a person's life is their relationship to the infinite. Psychology or psychiatry may give us answers and solutions on mental health issues, but religious conversion lies on one's spirituality, on the quality of meaning and purpose that one finds in his or her own relationship with God. These two paradigms, psychology and psychiatry on one hand and spirituality on the other, do not have to be dichotomized against each other. Psychology and psychiatry do not have to always pathologize people if they insert their own experiences of their spirituality in their clinical practice. On the other hand, spiritual directors do not have to spiritualize all human phenomena and negate the raw nature of people who possess intellectual and emotional lives of their own. Indeed, the two schools should complement each other. Humans are not born only to be healed from our past wounds and return to normalcy or back to normal. If that is so, then we do not have to change and choose life over death. We constantly change whether we like it or not, whether we are conscious of it or not. The Holy Spirit that dwells within us leads us to a never-ending process of transformation with our cooperative effort. We are born to create ultimately in union with our Creator. God will perfect us in holiness in His own time and place. Salvation is His, not ours. Some initial point then as we begin the first part on conversion in general. The first point, religious conversion is a complex process. In his book, Understanding Religious Conversion, Louis Ray Rambo writes, Overall, conversion is a process of religious change that occurs in a dynamic force 
field of people, events, ideologies, institutions, expectations, and experiences. It is a process over time, not a single event. Conversion is contextual and thereby influences and is influenced by matrix of relationships, expectations, and situations. And factors in the conversion process are multiple, interactive, and cumulative. He continues, as a complex human phenomenon, the psychological and sociological processes of religious conversion encompass a host of descriptions, perspectives, and theories. What we know about conversion is that it is a process of change that incorporates the sacred into the very core of individuals' identities, worldviews, and orientation, both to their own existence and to that of the world outside themselves. The process of conversion varies widely based on personal qualities, family environment, and social, societal, religious, cultural, and historical contexts, and the interactions among these factors. Second point, spiritual transformation is never smooth. Regressions happen. Specialists like Kill, Hood, and even Carl Jung have observed that individuals with religious conversion experience deep subjective changes in their self, including depersonalization, ambivalence, discontinuity of actions and feelings, hyperreflectivity, loss of naturalness, and heightened intrusive perception. Religious conversion is often associated with profound and broad changes in core personal identity and with the reconstruction of meaning-making systems, beliefs, attitudes, values, and purposes. Sometimes these changes are not without spiritual and religious struggles, accompanied by distress, confusion, anxiety, desperation, and depression, that is, the dark night of the soul. A quest for identity and finding who one really ought to be are among the main antecedents and driving forces of religious conversion. Consequently, the success of this journey is dominated by positive emotions, empowerment, meaning, and self-worth. Third point, religious conversion springs out of one's poverty. Personal crisis generally precedes spiritual conversion. Interestingly, studies show that people who have unhappy childhoods, traumas, and those who are exposed to various stresses are more prone to spiritual conversions. The childhood, adolescent, and young adulthood stages of Ignatius' life confirm this discovery, as we shall see later. Coupled with the Pamplona tragedy, Ignatius was ripe for the picking for his spiritual conversion. This presentation is about the religious or spiritual conversion or transformation of St. Ignatius of Loyola. To convert or conversion is derived from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin terms, meaning to turn, to return, and to turn again, as well as turning, returning, and turning about. Transformation may better describe the Ignatian journey from sinner to saint, an inner conversion of heart. Pollution and company write that religious conversion is a discontinuous transformational experiences that profoundly changes one's life. At any rate, regress regressions happen along the way. Studies have shown that emotions tended to fluctuate following conversion, and behavioral change was not guaranteed. In fact, in one study, subjects reported that they still struggled with the temptation to perform undesired behaviors, and some reported doubts. This happened to Ignatius, 
when riding on a mule, he wanted to kill that moor who desecrated the virginity of Mary. It was good that the mule chose the other road. The temptation to murder occurred just right after his initial conversion and his having supernatural visions in Leola and Manresa. A clear case of regression. The psychologist Adorno writes that such post-conversion regression would include one, an exaggerated, irrational intensity of belief. Two, more concerned with the form and doctrine than with the greater principle. Three, self-loathing attitude towards his previous life. Four, intolerance toward all deviates. Five, crusading zeal. Six, masochistic and sadistic activities. Regressive conversion symptoms appeared in Ignatius, even after his initial conversion, when he decided to leave Loyola for Manresa, even after his vision of the Madonna and child during his convalescence. He meant to go to Jerusalem, and he did, to convert the Moors single-handedly and follow the footsteps of Christ and plan to live there forever. In Manresa, he had the profound contempt of his past life, became overly scrupulous, and applied extreme penances on himself so that the Lord would forgive him. A writer writes, he was a solitary, cultivating an inner life, endowed with an incalculable wealth, a treasure to be worked upon by means of self-analysis and critical reflection. He would not allow anyone to accompany him to Jerusalem, and he found great difficulty in giving in to requests of his most intimate companions to dictate his autobiographical reminiscences. Yet a wealth of studies suggests that even profound and turbulent transformations may have a positive impact on personal development, creativity, the finding of meaning, empowerment, and openness to new experiences. Rambo has given us a useful framework in the dynamic process of conversion. These factors are multiple, interactive, and cumulative over time. Conversion is reflective of the whole process sketched below. He summarizes religious conversion in two several stages. First, the context. The second, crisis. Third, quests. Fourth, encounter. Fifth, interaction. Sixth, commitment. And seventh, consequences. These seven stages will serve as a framework of our presentation as we go through the life and journey of Ignatius of Leula and reflect on it from the lens of psycho-spirituality. Let us now consider these seven stages. First, context. Context is a total environment that informs all other stages. It is the dynamic force field of the multiple factors, historical, religious, social, cultural, and personal, that facilitates and constrains the conversion process. Second, crisis, which can be religious, political, psychological, or cultural. A crisis as it is a disruption in the world of the potential convert caused by either personal or social factors that often stimulates conquest or quest. Crises that are severe, prolonged, extensive, external, or bring discontinuity, like a mystical or near-death experience, or an illness, are often the crisis behind conversion. Rambo writes, a crisis, whatever quarter it springs from, will more likely stimulate activity to relieve the discomfort Resolve the discord, remove the sense of tension. 
The third stage, quests. Crisis leads to the quest for new meaning and purpose. This stage stresses the active nature of the potential convert's engagement with his or her predicament. The model does not exclude coercive situations, but emphasizes the agency of the convert. Fourth, encounter. That is, encounter with an advocate or advocates. This refers to the point of contact between the potential convert and a new religious or spiritual option. Fifth stage, interaction. This occurs when the advocate and potential convert engage in a more complex and extended exchange regarding the new option. During the interaction phase, new beliefs may be adopted, new rituals or behaviors attempted, new relationships cultivated, and new theological insights gained. Sixth stage, commitment. To a new belief system, and or a new community. Here the person makes decisions, embodies new commitments, constitutes a new identity, and is seen as a valid member of a community of faith. And finally, the stage of consequences. However, this does not occur only at the culmination of the process when experiences, identities, and commitments are consolidated. Rather, the potential convert is constantly assessing the effects of the new religious option and deciding whether the new religion is relevant and viable. Rambo summarizes the psychodynamics in his own understanding of conversion. One is identification, the intimate sense of joining oneself to a powerful leader or God. Second, interjection the incorporation of attributes of the leader or God into his own personality, specifically the superego. And third, displacement, the transferring of negative emotions from one person or thing to another person or thing. After his initial conversion, Ignatius identified himself with the saints who performed extreme sacrifices out of their own love for God. He interjected a God who forgives only if he mortifies his flesh. And he displaced his negative emotions like sadness and depression that he called desolations to the devil. To understand the complexity of the conversion process, Rambo discloses his paradoxical understanding of this process. He says conversion is a sudden and it's a gradual process. It is created totally by the action of God, and it is created totally by the action of humans. Conversion is personal and communal, private and public. It is both passive and active. It is a retreat from the world. It is a resolution of conflict and an empowerment to go into the world and to confront if not, create conflict. Conversion is an event and a process. It is an ending and a beginning. It is final and open-ended. Conversion leaves us devastated and transformed. With the high complex dynamics of religious conversion, one good fruit is that it makes the conver convert more real similar to the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. As Goldman writes, the notion of the real is about being alive, creative, spontaneous, and playful, cherishing one's uniqueness, accepting one's insignificance, tolerating one's destructive impulses, living with one's own insanity feeling integrated while retaining the capacity for unintegration, being receptive and open, and knowing how to make use of the world without needing to react to it, finding and contributing to the inherited cultural tradition, 
tolerating one's essential isolation without fleeing to false relationships or retreating into the latrious insulation. For Ignatius, whose god was his schoolmaster, his visions at Leola, River Cardonaire, Manresa, and La Storta were high moments of his transformative process, key moments in his life and the life of the Society of Jesus. We shall now begin reflecting on the life, journey, and conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola from the perspective of psychospirituality. First, the context. Ignatius was born on October 23, 1491, and died on July 31, 1556. He was the youngest of 12 or 13 children and was christened Inigo, or the little one. His full name was Inigo Lopez de Oñas y Loyola, from Aspesia, Kipuzkoa, Crown of Castile. His father, Don Beltran, and his mother, Doña Marina, belonged to the minor and hereditary nobility, titles of which were a legal prerogative of the King of Spain. Ignatius came from a peasant aristocratic family. The Loyolas had iron ore in their territory, which made them health wealthy. With their wealth, they built their castle. There were not educated people, and Inigo's tonsure ceremony as a child was not followed by the usual primary education offered to potential clerics. The family was Basque, a southwestern European ethnic group, and belonged to the order of Isabella the Catholic, a Spanish civil order in which membership is granted in recognition of services that benefit the country. In fact, Inigo's brother, Juan Perez, died fighting in the Italian wars. His four other older brothers fought and died as well. He also had a brother priest. In Inigo's time, the Basques were colonizers, shipbuilders, miners, tax collectors, and soldiers. They were known as being straightforward, obstinate, intensely religious, group-oriented, charitable, and yet superstitious people who were slow in speech, gifted in music and dancing, and morally lax. Their surplus children were consigned to clerical or monastic celibacy or to emigration. Several of Inigo's brothers were soldiers, and one had his own ship. As a late-born Inigo did not stand to inherit any of the family's wealth, and at the age of seven, he took the tonsure in the church, the first step to priestly ordination. 15th and 16th centuries were the Renaissance period, the rise of Western civilization. The names of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Copernicus, Galileo Galilei, Christopher Columbus became prominent. Spain and Portugal began to colonize large parts of Central and South America and dominated the greater Antilles that included Mexico, Peru, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. Trade was opened across the Pacific Ocean and Jews were expelled from Spain. Also worth mentioning here was the foundation of the Spanish Inquisition in 1478 and the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. In 1469 rose the Catholic monarchs to the marriage of King Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Isabella I of Castile, which united the two kingdoms into Spain. Inigo's mother died soon after his birth, and the local blacksmith's wife, Maria de Garin, took care of him and breastfed him in her farmhouse beside the Leola home. At age seven, Inigo returned to Casa Leola, and as a young boy, his father had him tonsured in anticipation of the possibility of his following a clerical career. He then served his relative Don Velasquez, the treasurer of the Kingdom of Castile, as a page. 
We know that during childhood, children are both physically and emotionally dependent on parents or caretakers. In addition, this is the stage when the individual is very sensitive to what is going on around him and when the first seeds are planted for possible future changes and transformations. From the day he was born to age seven, Inigo lived in a neighbor's humble farmhouse away from his family's castle in Leola. Only when he reached the age of seven, when Martin, his oldest brother, married Magdalena, that Inigo returned to his family home, whereupon his older sister-in-law took care of him. His remote and dominant father died when Inigo was 16 years old. He often fought with Inigo's brothers, had a mistress, and lived in a different home, and so was seldom seen by his family. He was also busy with his business obligations. It was he who sent Inigo away from home as a young adolescent to serve Don Velasquez, the treasurer of the Kingdom of Castile. In his early teens, as a page of Don Velasquez de Cuelar in Arevalo, which is 76 miles from Leola, Inigo came to know him as an erudite man with a huge Renaissance library. Later, however, Inigo saw the man's moral and economic collapse when he had to leave his office after the deaths of Ferdinand and Isabella. The treasurer joined protests against the curtailment of privileges that followed the accession of the foreigner Charles V to the Spanish throne. He eventually submitted after being threatened by troops. But this disgrace, along with other disasters, led to a fit of melancholy during which he died. This sad event, they say, had a lasting influence on Inigo. Around 1518, a disillusioned Inigo went at the age of 26 or 27 into the service of another relative, the Duke of Nahera and the Viceroy of Navarre. He accompanied the Duke on diplomatic journeys and served as a gentleman soldier. In 1518, his brother Martin secured the primogeniture, the exclusive right to inheritance from King Charles I, who became Emperor Charles V, for assisting him with the help of Inigo to ascend the throne of Castile and Navarre. The promotion of his brother's family may have been a minor tragedy for the ambitious Inigo and played a part in his turning away from the world. For him and for his family, should he establish one, Martin's promotion meant that they had lost the chance to head the Leola clan. In his autobiography, Ignatius started to reflect upon his life and to turn away from the world at the age of 26, which would be at the time of the Velasquez tragedy. We can mention here that one study in particular revealed that the long-term internal disharmony and dis dissatisfaction were more frequent antecedents of conversion than actual life crises. And as a consequence of transformation, the representation of the self was fundamentally changed. God-centered rather than self-centered, serving God's purpose, giving control to God, dying to self, lesser self-preoccupation, and self-forgiveness. Imagine Ignatius, who lost his mother immediately after he was born was adopted by his neighbor's wife and lived in her humble farmhouse, instead in his family's Leola castle, for the first seven years of his life. Was consigned to a priestly career as a child by his own absentee and womanizing father, left Leola again to serve as a relative, to serve a relative as a page, left his service with a low morale, and entered again into the service of a military man, lost some of his brothers from war, and lost his family inheritance. These were the long-term internal disharmony and dissatisfaction that conversion experts talk about. How did our saint 
cope with these. With the background of his youth, Ignatius must have sensed a form of powerlessness and helplessness. According to Dr. William Meissner, the Jesuit psychiatrist, an essential depressive core can be found in Ignatius' character due to the early death of his mother and the absence of his father. Another psychoanalyst master writes that in the young Ignatius was a hidden depression and indifference associated with restlessness and an attempt to deny his powerlessness. This is a common early and primitive defense and is often connected with an attempt to avoid recognition of the uncomfortable. On this basic lack of mother's presence, psychologist Ignacio Telechea raises the question, did he ever have the opportunity to know her and did she always remain simply a faceless name for him? I strongly suspect the latter, and I believe that the intensity with which the death of his mother affected him during the course of his childhood days must have felt its indelible mark on the deepest part of his psyche. He was a man who could not recover the lost object of his infancy. It is interesting to note that in all his writings, Ignatius did not refer to the figure of the mother. Ignatius was introverted and solitary, even though he lived in the company of others. He remained a person who took refuge within himself, retreated into an inner space which he explored and which he needed to protect zealously in his contacts with others. The idealization of his longing for this lost maternal figure played a part in his dream of a service to a certain lady not of ordinary nobility, not a countess, nor a duchess. In addition to his fantasy of chivalric tales, to which he imagined this lady falling in love with him too, historians say that this lady was no other than Infanta Catalina, sister of the Emperor Charles V, daughter of Queen Juana La Loca, who would later become the Queen of Portugal. Idealization here means a psychological or mental process of attributing overly positive qualities to another person or thing. They feel intense closeness, closeness towards that person and place them on a pedestal. In particular, there will be that great maternal figure of Mary, the Lady of Montserrat, before whom he would lay down his arms in accordance with the knightly custom of the time. Meissner, in his psychoanalysis of Inigo, the little one, analyzes motherless childhood as persistent but inarticulate longing for the total love and security experienced in actuality by children with adequate mothers. Most likely that such a boy will identify with the lost mother. Meissner also believed that Inigo followed his father's example as a soldier and a passionate lover of women. At age 17, Inigo joined the army under the auspices of the Duke of Nahera, a professional soldier. And as a young adolescent and a young adult, he was into dancing, fencing, gambling, pursuit of young ladies, and dueling. When he was 24 years old at the carni carnival in Especia, a police report stated atrocious crimes carried out during the night with premeditation and involving ambush and treachery. In these crimes, his brother priest was also involved. We find the first sentence in his autobiography. Up to his 26th year, he was a man given over to the vanity of the world and took a special delight in the exercise of arms with a great and vain desire of winning glory. Commentators say that Ignatius was a pathological narcissist before his first conversion at Leola. DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder 
or NDP, are as follows. A preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. A belief that he or she is special and unique can and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. A need for excessive admiration and sense of entitlement. Polanco, Ignatius' secretary, wrote, he was specially ill-behaving gaming and things relating to women and brawls and arm fighting. Since Inigo was a product of his culture and his time, the features that stand out in his personality are those that were characteristically valued highly by the code of chivalry in the culture of 16th century Spain. Prowess in self-defense, and in the arts of war, loyalty, generosity, courtesy, and the pursuit of glory, fierce pride, and unquestionable courage. Before his conversion, Inigo, standing at 5 feet and 2 inches, or 5 feet and 3 inches, was a courtier. A courtier is a person who is often in attendance at the court of a monarch or other royal personage. Historically, the court was the center of government as well as the residence of the monarch, and the social and political life were often completely mixed there. Inigo was also a knight nobleman who was granted an honorary title of knighthood by the head of state for his military service. In 1517, when he was 26 years old, Ignatius became a knight under another relative, Antonio Manrique de Lara, Duke of Najera and Viceroy of Navarre. As a knight of the king, he observed the code of chivalry and the ideals of courtly love. Prowess in the use of dagger, sword, buckler, and crossbow good horsemanship, and related skills were essential components of the young Leola's sense of identity. Just very briefly, to understand Ignatius' mindset at that time, the Ten Commandments of Chivalry are as follows. Number one, thou shalt believe all that the Church teaches, and thou shalt observe all its directions. Number two, thou shalt defend the church. Three, thou shalt respect all weaknesses and shalt constitute thyself the defender of them. Four, thou shalt love the country in which thou was born. Five, thou shalt not recoil before thine enemy. Six, Thou shalt make war against the infidel without cessation and without mercy. Seven, thou shalt perform scrupulously thy feudal duties if they be not contrary to the laws of God. Eight, thou shalt not lie and thou shalt remain faithful to thy pledged word. Nine, Thou shalt be generous and give largesse to everyone. 10. Thou shalt be everywhere and always be the champion of the right and the good against injustice and evil. No wonder Ignatius put his rules for thinking with the church at the last part of his spiritual exercises. No wonder that the Jesuits have this fourth vow of special obedience to the Pope for missions. No wonder Ignatius quoted saying, What seems to me white, I will believe black, if the hierarchical church so defines. In this sense, the Jesuits are really conservative in church matters, as opposed to liberal, as many suppose. We also see here the background of his kingdom meditation. In Specs Numbers 22 to 97, in Commandment Number 7, 
His sense of feudal duty is reflected well. He writes, This will be to consider the address this king makes to all his subjects with the words, It is my will to conquer all the lands of the infidel. Therefore, whoever wishes to join with me in this enterprise must be content with the same food, drink, clothing, etc. as mine. So too, he must work with me by day and watch with me by night, that as he has had a share in the toil with me, afterwards he may share in the victory with me. If such a summon of an earthly king to his subjects deserves our attention, how much more worthy of consideration is Christ our Lord, the eternal King, before whom is assembled the whole world, to all his summons goes forth, and to each one in particular, he addressed the words, It is my will to conquer the whole world and all my enemies, and thus to enter into glory of my Father. Therefore, whoever wishes to join me in this enterprise must be willing to labor with me, that by following me in suffering, he may follow me in glory. The family's coat of arms depict the wolves looking into the pot that shows they have enough food that even the wolves, lobas e ola, can come and eat. That's commandment number nine of the chivalry code. The seven stripes represent the blood shed by the seven members of the family for the king, while the gold background represents the family's loyalty to the king of Spain. We now move on to the second phase of conversion, the crisis. The Pamplona Cannonball experience happened on May 20, 1521. Ignatius was 30 years old, and that experience shattered his ego ideal. The cannonball that bounced off the wall of the fortress tore open his left calf and broke the right shin. While lying on the battlefield, the French army, impressed by his honorable courage, tasked a surgeon to operate on him. He was then brought to the Loyola home, 66 kilometers away, but the rigors of the journey worsened his wounds. There, he underwent a second operation, but unsatisfied with the result, he again went under the knife and saw for the third time without anesthesia. At his Loyola home, Inigo knew he was dying, and so he made his confession and received the sacrament of the anointing. On the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, however, he was declared out of danger from death. He must have experienced John of the cross dark night of the senses, the negation of all creation, and the dark night of the spirit, negation of the creator, when the negation of all came into his being. Psychologists would say that the conversion experience is associated with certain more or less regressive phenomena, a loosening or relaxation of the synthetic capacity of the ego, resulting in a degree of internal dissociation and fragmentation connected with a sense of estrangement. The onset of the subjective experience of estrangement heralds the initial disintegration of the ego and is often associated with a sense of confusion regarding the self and its identity. The fragmented aspects of the self-organization dissociated from their integration with the individual's sense of self are usually dealt with defensively, more often than not by projection. We can conjecture that in some degree, Inigo must have experienced something like this, the state of internal self-disintegration. Studies show that when there's a loss of consciousness and the present cognitive structure loses its grip over the individual, a new vision is born. The new vision gives a person a new perspective that comes from a transcendental realm outside oneself. The experience of closeness to death frequently plays a part in unleashing mystical experiences. One writer notes that Ignatius is brought to the precipice of death of the body, a void and absolute negation. 
the power of the narcissist paradox comes into play when, as he denies death, he denies God, and so denies the self. It is at this point that God entered his life, filling a void and drawing Ignatius back, physically and spiritually, from the precipice of death. Taylor refers the movement from nullification to beification. Absolute emptiness empties the self of itself by overcoming its self-centeredness. The negativity of his narcissism and subsequently his self-loathing are replaced with a positive love of God. The individual moves away from the self, literally away from the notion that self is the center, in order first to embrace an emptiness, an absence of self, and then be eventually be filled with the light and love of God. At this juncture, the critical experience at Loyola occurred that seems to have been the central event in Nijo's conversion experience, namely, a vision of Our Lady holding the Christ child. He wrote, One night, as he lay awake, he saw clearly the likeness of Our Lady with the Holy Child Jesus, at the sight of which he received a most abundant consolation for a considerable interval of time. He felt so great a disgust with his past life, especially with his offenses of the flesh, that he thought all such images which has formerly occupied his mind were wiped out. And from that hour, he never again consented to the least suggestion of the flesh. The vision of the Madonna and the child made him hate his past life and triggered a new beginning of a creation of a new self which at the Manresa cave he would have to deal with by wrestling with his inner demons. In a 2019 study, participants reported that mystic and religious experiences are influential at the stage of rediscovering religion. Individuals start, accelerate, or end their process of conversion by means of a dream or mystical experience. Ignatius' case, the Madonna, and child vision. During the period of inquiry or putting things in order while having a life distant from religious culture. Such experience has been a breaking point or milestone for individuals who began to seek information and question religion and steered towards religion through repentance under such influence. It is interesting to note that while female participants often report mystical experience after making the decision to make interreligious conversion, male participants like Ignatius rather undergo mystical experiences before conversion. A study shows that the intellectual, emotional, experimental, and mystical motives come to the forefront during the religious conversion process. Individuals rediscover religion and become involved in the process of conversion when they have the strongest feeling of deficiency. In light of the interviews of said study, the first behavior following the decision-making process is repentance and praying. This was true in the case of Ignatius, who in Manresa practiced extreme fasting and penances and prayed several hours a day. This self-hatred and eventually the negation of his old self, with a positive and upward movement towards God, caught the attention of the household of the Loyola home. As Ignatius describes, his brother and the rest of the household knew from his exterior the change that had been working inwardly in his soul. The effect of conversion is a transformed self. The attachment to a real or imagined figure transforms the converts. They found a new sense of intimate relationship with God. As Rambo observes, God is no longer an abstract concept, but the living reality. Converts experience significant improvements in the sense of self, self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-identity. Religious conversion brings a change in self-perceptions, 
identity, attitudes, behaviors, goals, and strivings. However, it does not alter the personality structure. For his part, William James explained that the divided self was unified in conversion and that resulted in positive emotions. Positive emotion is attached with religious experience. Scholars generally agree that the conversion experience is preceded by some kind of emotional disturbance. However, the converts find that their emotional turmoil is quietened in conversion through the religious experience. James recognized that at the conversion, the divided self is unified and is happier. And so conversion provides relief to emotional turmoil. Existential questions are answered by the religious experience and through the surrendering of one's life to God. For Ignatius, the immediate effects of the religious experience of the Madonna and Child at Loyola were happiness, peace, and joy. Converts indeed report experiencing an increase in the subjective well-being, behavioral changes, having a sense of being closer to God, and surrendering the self. The formal surrendering of self in the life of Ignatius happened when he surrendered his arms to the Lady of Montserrat and changed into a poor pilgrim's clothes. A 2019 study indicated that as auxiliary elements in the process of conversion, some participants reported that they underwent conversion by reading books through contemplation, because of curiosity about religion, or even in the wake of a traumatic event. Some participants reported that they wondered and read about religion to rediscover it on their way to conversion. Relevant studies put forth that intellectual curiosity and questioning are among the essential motives behind religious conversion. It is possible to say that the intellectual sense of wonder and inquiry start the process of conversion. Traumatic events may have a triggering effect on all this. Traumatic experiences are among stimulating elements for individuals with regard to religious conversion. Participants indicate that feelings such as loneliness and unhappiness in the wake of traumatic events influence the process of conversion. Ignatius' convalescence in his family home at Leola lasted for around 10 months. While convalescing, he asked for books on courtly love and chivalry. But since there was none available, Magdalena, his sister-in-law, gave him books on the lives of saints. The Flor Sanctorum, The Golden Legend by Jacobus de Varagin, and four volumes of the life of Christ, De Vita Christi, the principal work of the German Carthusian theologian, Ludolf of Saxony, in the 14th century. The book had significant influence on the development of techniques for Christian meditation by introducing the concept of immersing and projecting oneself into a biblical scene about the life of Jesus. The prayer methods there had great influence in Ignatius, so much so that he applied them in his spiritual exercises. We now call this technique the Ignatian Contemplation. In the introduction of the De Vita Christi, which is a meditation and a prologue of John's Gospel, Christ is called the Salutis Fundamentum, or Soul Fundament of Salvation. God is with you, not only through essence, power, and potency, as God is with all things, and not only through grace, as God is to those who are sanctified, but also through the taking on of our flesh. Ignatius later wrote in his autobiography, by the frequent reading of these books, he conceived some affection for what he found there narrated. For pausing in his reading, he gave himself up to thinking over what he had read. At other times, he dwelt on the things of the world, which formerly had occupied his thoughts. Nevertheless, our Lord came to his assistance, for he saw to it, that these thoughts were succeeded by others, which sprang forth from the things he was reading. In reading the life of the Lord and the lives of the saints, he paused to think and reason with himself. Suppose that I should do what St. Francis did 
what Saint Dominic did. He thus let himself, his thoughts run over many things that seemed good to him, always putting before himself things that were difficult and important, which seemed to him easy to accomplish when he proposed them. But all he thought was to tell himself, Saint Dominic did this, therefore I must do it. Saint Francis did this, therefore I must do it. These thoughts also lasted a good while. And then other things taking their place, the worldly thoughts about, above mentioned came upon him and remained a long time with him. This succession of diverse thoughts was of long duration, and they were either of worldly achievements, which he desired to accomplish, or those of God, which he took hold of his imagination to such an extent that worn out with the struggle. He turned them all aside and gave his attention to other things. He acquired no little light from this reading and began to think more seriously of his past life and the great need he had of doing penance for it. It was during this reading that these desires of imitating the saints came to him, but with no further thought of circumstances than of promising to do with God's grace than what they had done. At this point, I would like to briefly talk about narcissism and Ignatius' ideal ego. The DSM-4 describes narcissistic personality as having grandiose sense of self-importance or uniqueness preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, and believes that he or she is special and unique. Significantly, Meissner, the Jesuit psychiatrist, wrote that the cannonball experience of Ignatius shattered the narcissistic grandiosity and omnipotence of so prominent in his character. Narcissism was a broad river across the landscape of Ignatius' interpsychic world. It is in the vicissitudes and transformations of that narcissism that much of his psychology is played out. Self-absorption has now progressed into self differentiation, the capacity of the man to differentiate himself from external things. Freud said that a person cannot love another before he or she develops the capacity to differentiate from objects. Meister said that the narcissism is a state in which the libido resides in the as yet undifferentiated self. Ignatius himself writes in his spiritual exercises, that a person will make progress in all spiritual matters in proportion to his flight from self-love, self-will, and self-interest. For some authors, Ignatius was a narcissist. Ignatius himself depicted himself in the first line, lines of his autobiography as such. Until the age of 26, he was a man given up to the vanities of the world, and his chief delight used to be in the exercise of arms with a great and vain desire to gain honor. Just think of this man who had himself butchered the third time out of his vain pleasure because a bone protruded over one leg and looked ugly, and both of his legs were not even. And without painkillers and in complete silence without a moan or a word, though he limped, all his life after this ordeal. This he did for his pleasure, to gratify his own inclinations. He also submitted himself to this butchery because of his shame of personal defeat that is closely linked to narcissism and to his chivalric ideals. Even in his convalescing bed, Inigo imagined fantasizing about a lady in court. And he also compared himself to the saints. Saint Dominic did this, therefore I have to do it. Saint Francis did this, and therefore I have to do it. See here the traces of the I instill the presence of self glorification and imaginary identification with these two great saints. A psychologist wrote that these saints took on the role of a strange knight whom he was to rival in the accomplishment of mighty deeds. He knew he had no knowledge of what humility was, but he wanted, as he wrote, 
to do these exterior deeds because the saints had done them. One author wrote, we can hear the echoes of the sentiments clearly in Nigo's shattered sense of self. The second element is a positive ideal for which the individual yearns and toward which he struggles. This element too emerges clearly in Inigo's imaginative stirrings and fantasies of doing great and heroic deeds in imitation of the great saints. In the ordinary run of cases, the sense of sinfulness dominates the picture, almost becoming an obsession. The process of conversion is thus at first dominated by the need to escape from sinfulness rather than to strive towards an ideal. Also in convalescence at Loyola, while he thought of the things of the world, while he felt dry and disoriented, discontented, he was content and happy when he imagined himself going to Jerusalem barefoot, eating herbs and imitating the saints. Ignatius said in his autobiography, nor did he stop to ponder the difference until one time his eyes were opened a little and he began to marvel at the difference and to reflect upon it, realizing from experience that some thoughts left him sad and others happy. Little by little, he came to recognize the difference between the spirits that agitated him, one from the demon, the other from God. It is interesting to note that one writer, Solomon, David Solomon, had to say about Ignatius' conversion, and even his mysticism. He wrote that narcissism plays an important role in the development of the Christian mystic. He said that the spiritual self must emerge from the narcissistic self, the paradox of narcissism and mysticism. The depth and quality of the self-knowledge is full of himself, of a narcissist, is a prelude to one's transformative process towards the mystical journey. He cites St. John of the Cross, who wrote that the initiate must achieve the practice of self-knowledge, which is the first thing that the soul must achieve in order to come to the knowledge of God. For the French Jesuit psychologist Louis Bernard, the new life undertaken by Ignatius was simultaneously a rejection and a continuation of his former life. Father Pedro Rupes said Ignatius follows his wildest ambitions. Former gentleman in court, captain on the battlefield, aspiration for the noble lady, desire to outstrip the, sa the, the saints, and accepts his own measure, the mystery of his puniness and unworthiness, are called to collaborate in the divine action. Evelyn Underhill, the famous English writer on spirituality and mysticism, citing the Victorine mystics, wrote that the climb up the mountain to self-knowledge is a necessary prelude to illumination and eventually union. While self-knowledge and self-awareness serve as the beginning of Christian transformation, forgetting the self, one's knowledge of all creation and even the creator himself, the paradox of knowing by unknowing is the next step. The person enters into a dark void and emptiness of nothing in order to encounter the true God. As Teresa of Avila said, the soul should sometimes cease thinking of itself to rise in meditation on the grandeur and majesty of its God. So the Genesius even told Timothy to abandon knowledge and embrace darkness, to go beyond unknowing and light. In other words, the converting person goes from the light of self-knowledge to the darkness of unknowing. However, Solomon writes that the major difference between the Christian mystic and the pathological narcissist is that the mystic emerges from this stage to pursue a higher cause while the narcissist usually remains mired in the self, unable to escape his world of self-obsession and self-importance. Freud differentiated a healthy narcissism from a pathological one. He said that narcissism could contribute to the development of strong independent personalities, 
which by virtue of their own innate narcissistic dynamic can prefer to love rather than loved. They are suited to the service of others, can assume the role of leaders, and give a strong stimulus to the development of culture. And so it was that Inigo de Leola, as he lay on his bed of convalescence, began to experience the transformation of his own internal values. He found himself shifting from a narrower, narcissistic, and even juvenile ideal and set of values to a broader, higher, nobler, and more spiritual orientation. Nearly 500 years later, Loyola's experience has striking parallels with today's countless victims of war. Millions have suffered both physical and psychic wounds, displaying the classic symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, flashbacks, nightmares, social withdrawal, in a profoundly negative mood. However, Leola's life provides us with an inspiring case, case study of PTG, post-traumatic growth, a recent concept in psychology. People, people are discovering that many trauma survivors are resilient. Somehow, they are able to achieve positive transformation, transcendence, and dramatic personal growth while well, they engage in the challenging and often painful process of resolving their crises. A survivor may eventually bounce back after a trauma, but a thriver, such as Ignatius, can reach even greater heights of PTG. Studies of PTG have found that thrivers experience profound changes in their perceptions of themselves, their relationships with others, and their philosophy of life. These benefits include feeling more confident, becoming more self-reliant, feeling more compassion for humanity, appreciating life more deeply, and experiencing a more profound sense of spirituality. We now end the first part of this presentation. Here, we have provided the overall framework for reflecting on the phenomenon of conversion and started to go through the story of St. Ignatius' life and conversion up to his time of recuperation in the castle of Leola. For our next presentation, part two, we'll begin with Ignatius' journey after his convalescence in Leola and onwards. <music>